I'll do a detour and discuss something else, which is uh, a bit lighter and uh, it's uh, good for the mo It's good for you know to start with in the morning, and also uh, it's you know something that you know at the end you might remember this from the from the school. So it's about uh, Sudoku. Okay. So uh, you know after you finish the school and you go home. Uh, and your friends or family might ask you, you know, what did you learn in the school? So this is something that you can tell them and they'll be able to understand even, even if they didn't study cryptography or, uh, or uh, computer science. So uh, you all know the uh, uh, Sudoku puzzle, right? Uh, you have this puzzle, some entries are open and we have to fill all the other entries so that in each row, each column, and each uh, subgrid uh, will have the uh, numbers from one to nine. And because we're computer scientists, we can think about you know, the general case, and the general case, we'll talk about an N uh, over N puzzle. In this case, uh, N is nine, and yeah. We, you know, we, you know, humans usually only work with uh, N equals nine. Okay. So, you know, once Sudoku became very popular you know, all over the world, you know, uh, then Moni Nao came with the question, uh, how can we, uh, okay, how can we do zero knowledge for Sudoku? Okay, so, and then we came up with, you know, uh, this set of authors came up with this uh, paper, cryptographic, cryptographic and physical uh, protocols, uh, or, you know, zero knowledge proof systems for solutions of Sudoku puzzles. So just as a question, uh, who, who here in the audience have heard about this uh, zero knowledge for Sudoku before? That's very, it's actually very nice because uh, when we came up with this result, I mean, no, no one was interested, it was published, I mean, didn't get almost any citations, but in recent years when zero knowledge became uh, more popular, then this came up as a, a a nice example to explain zero knowledge to others, to you know, lay persons. So here's the setting. Alice and Bob uh, solve, try to solve a Sudoku puzzle. And Bob said, you know, I solved it. And Alice doesn't believe Bob. And she wants him to prove to her. So one easy way for him to prove to her that he solved the puzzle is to uh, show her the solution. But suppose they don't want to do this because maybe Alice you know, enjoys solving the puzzle and she doesn't, Bob to, doesn't want Bob to ruin the experience for her or because there's a prize for the puzzle. So the goal is to do a zero knowledge proof in which Bob will prove to Alice that he uh, solved the puzzle. So uh, you know, since we've been in this winter school, we know that there is a zero knowledge proof for any language in NP. So of course they can translate, uh, this is an NP problem, uh, Sudoku, they can you know, uh, translate it to uh, uh, a problem which is NP complete, like Hamiltonicity, and then do a zero knowledge proof for Hamiltonicity. So computer programs can do this easily. The question how, you know, Bob and Alice, just, you know, regular persons can do this proof. Okay, so the first idea that comes to mind is a translation of a cryptographic protocol, you know, a known protocol, to solving, uh, to solving Sudoku between people so this is based on a known protocol for three colorability, and the protocol goes like this. Okay. So the prover who knows the solution chooses a random permutation between the numbers one to n, that's one to nine, to one to n. Then in each entry on the board, the prover puts a commitment to the you know, permuted value of that entry. So if an entry had the value two and the permutation of two is five, he puts on that entry a commitment to five. I didn't yet, haven't yet defined what commitment is, but I assume most of you know what commitments are. And then V chooses at random one of three n plus one options. Uh, v, the verifier, can choose either a row, either a column, either a subgrid. These are three n options. Three and options and ask the uh, prover to open the commitments on them. Or the verifier can prove, uh, uh, can choose, uh, open for me all the field entries, all the entries uh, which, where the numbers were already, already you know, shown on, on, on the puzzle. And whatever the verifier chooses, uh, the prover has to open. 
and then the verifier verifies that they make sense. So if the verifier asks for a row, he makes sure that all the entries in this row are the numbers one to n in some order. Same for current and subgrid. If uh, the verifier asks to open the you know, pre-filled options, he checks that this is indeed a permutation of the original values. So this is another way of doing it. This is the you know, initial grid. This is the permutation. So one goes to four, two goes to uh, eight, and so on. And suppose we have three here at the top, then three goes to three. So the prover will put you know, a commitment to three on that location. Instead of the eight, he'll put a commitment to seven. And all other entries will put commitments to what he saw. So. so obviously, if the prover knows how to uh, uh, how to solve the puzzle, he can solve this puzzle, uh, and, and, and he can and he can uh, succeed in the proof. The question is uh, about soundness. Uh, what happens with the prover who doesn't know how to solve the puzzle? Can he uh, prove that he knows the solution? So, uh, if the prover can answer all three n plus one challenges, then he knows how to solve the puzzle. So, therefore, if the prover doesn't know how to solve the puzzle, there's at least one challenge of the verifier which the prover will not know how to solve. So therefore, the prover will be caught, the cheating prover will be caught the probability 1 over 3n plus 1. If n is 9, this is 1 over 28. So uh, this is you know, not so good. So the cheater, the, a cheater can cheat with probability 27 over 28, which is not that good. Okay. Um, but there is a better cryptographic protocol with, uh, 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 with uh, 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 commitments that can, be, can get a constant soundness error, uh, zero knowledge. So basically, we want to show that we can distribute the, uh, uh, I'll just skip this, zero knowledge is pretty trivial here, and knowledge extraction also is trivial. Okay, so the question is, uh, I'm skipping this because we have to, you know, this is like, you know, before the main talk that I'm, I'm, we're going to give today, so I want to be fast. So the question is, uh, is this a good protocol if you want to run it with your friends? And maybe not. So the commitments we can uh, implement using, like, envelopes, that's good. But, you know, envelopes cost money, so we need a lot of envelopes here. And we have to, okay, the soundness error is not that good, so we have to repeat it you know, many times. So we need a lot of envelopes and do it over and over again because the cheater can cheat with probability 27 over 28. And also, uh, we need to compute permutations and put the values according to permutations. And this is kind of hard for humans. Like you have to remember the mapping and work according to it. And we kind of thought, okay, is there a protocol we can actually you know, run? You know, with you know, Alice and Bob and can 10 people to do it. So this is possible, but it will take people a lot of time to do. Uh, so we try to optimize and do a protocol which is easier for to people to run and just kind of, what we did here is a translation of a cryptographic, you know, computerized protocol to a setting with humans. And we wanted to do like a protocol for humans that will be easier for them. So we came up with ideas that use cards. So here's the idea. Uh, so we prepare a large board like the Sudoku, and the prover assigns a card with the right value to each cell. So that we take the cards one to nine, we assign a card to each cell, and the prover puts the card on the cell. Uh, if the cell was you know, pre-written, the prover puts the card with face up, so the verifier can see you know, if this cell had one on it, he sees a card which has a one on it. Otherwise, the prover puts the card face down, so the verifier cannot see what's there. And then the verifier chooses, says one of three things, rows, columns, or subgrids. And then the prover, if suppose the verifier said uh, rows, he takes the cards on each row, shuffles them, uh, and then shows them to the verifier, and shows to the verifier that in each row he had the cards one to nine. So, I don't have it. So if you think about it, uh, about the implementation, it's simpler, okay, we thought it's simpler for humans because you just have to put cards and then shuffle them. Actually, I did demos with you know, children when we actually implemented this protocol by children. It's, it's simp simpler than doing permutations. Uh, okay, completeness is perfect. If I know the solution, I can always convince the verifier. Soundness, then if 
the prover doesn't know a solution, then the prover cannot, you know, any way he puts the cards, uh, there's going to be either one row, one column, or one subgrid which the prover cannot, uh, 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 we, you know, which won't have a nice permutation. So therefore, he'll be called the probability one over three. So we can only achieve probability two over three, which is better than before. And zero knowledge, we want to show that uh, basically the, the verifier uh, can simulate what's happening here. So the verifier just puts the cards, you know, uh, he, or the verifier knows what the challenge will be. So he puts the cards so that if it opens you know, the rows, the cards in each row will have a permutation. If he opens the uh, columns, the card, see each column will have a permutation and so on. So the same simulation we have in regular zero, zero knowledge. In the simulation, we know what the challenge is, so we prepare the settings so that the challenge will work. Okay. Now, uh, when we look at this protocol, then we say, okay, is, is it good for humans? Is it uh, easy for humans to run it? And then as computer scientists, we start you know, thinking about, uh, okay, different uh, uh, measurements. So one measurement is the number of cards. We'd like it to be small. Another is the number of shuffles that users have to do, because shuffles are hard. And the soundness error, because we want the you know, cheating probability to be small. So the protocol I describe here is the first one. OK, this, this one. So the number of cards is n square, like 9 square. Uh, we're doing uh, nine shuffles, one for each row, say. And the soundness error is 2 over 3. And because we computer scientists, we came, out with be we came with better protocols that you know, do maybe less shuffles, the last one, and have a much better uh, soundness error, much more soundness error. Uh, so I'll describe to you one of these protocols. So uh, here again, we have grid and uh, 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 cards. And here we have a Sudoku puzzle. and. Uh, Hebrew readers will notice two things. One is this is a hard, it says it's, hard, it's, hard, it's a hard puzzle. And this is the date, like 2007, it's like an old work. Uh, and then, suppose we solved it, then the prover puts on each uh, uh, location three cards. Uh, on the locations which were pre-written, pre he puts the cards face up. So, like previously, we had like four here. So here he puts like the four card three times. And in the other locations, he puts three cards that should be, you know, whatever you know, number he puts as a solution there. But he puts these cards face down. And now the verifier takes from each uh, uh, entry, each location, uh, the three cards and assigns them at random. One will go to a packet that corresponds to the column, another packet to, that corresponds to the row and a third one to a packet that corresponds to the subgrid. So at the end, you see here, like for each column, we have a packet for each row and for each uh, uh, subgrid. And from each location, we chose the cards at random to these three packets. Yeah. Uh, and people can do that. I don't know, I, ch I checked it with children. They can, uh, they, they can, they can do it. And then uh, they shuffle each, uh, each of these packets. And they verify that the packets, each, all of the packets contains the number one to nine. OK, and if not, the verify rejects. So OK, if I know a solution, then I always succeed in proving. And the nice thing here is perhaps the soundness. So what happens if I don't know uh, a solution? So uh, OK, if I put three identical cards on each cell, I don't know a solution. So I'm going to be caught because one of the rows, columns, or subgrids will not have the number one to nine. So I cannot put uh, in each cell the, exact, the, the same three cards. So there must be at least one cell in which I'll put three cards which are not the same. Okay. Then there's a time when I, uh, the three cards on this cell has to be divided, one for the row, one for the column, and one for the subgrid. And for me to succeed, the, the way I divide them to row, or the way the verifier chooses to divide them to the row, column, and subgrid, uh, must be such that the card which is unique will go to you know, the right packet, either the row, column, or subgrid. Okay? And this will happen in probability one over three. 
So therefore, the you know, a cheating prover will be called probability one over three. If you think about it a bit more, uh, then we said that at least one cell, uh, you know, if I don't know a solution, one cell must not have three identical cards. Something that also happens in the verification is that the verifier, you know, uh, globally verifies that we have the same number of cards from each type. Uh, the same number of one cards as two cards, three cards, and so on. This means that if I cheat in one cell and put the three cards which are not the same, I must also cheat in another cell and put the three cards which are not the same so that together, you know, I'll have the, you know, the same number of cards of each type in the, in the entire board. So if you think about it more, you see that I can, in this case, I'll be caught the probability, like I, I can only succeed in cheating in probability one over nine. I have to guess, you know, what the verifier will, will do in both of, these, uh, uh, both of these cells. So therefore, I can cheat with this small probability. Uh, so this was the second protocol. And the third protocol is where uh, uh, instead of the verifier checking each row and column and subgrid in, 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 uh, uh, separately, he takes a few rows together and shuffles them together and just checks that if he took, suppose, four rows and shuffles them together, he checks that he, at the end he gets four ones, four twos, four threes, and so on. Uh, and he, you can show with much more elaborate math that even you know, there the, uh, a cheating uh, prover will be caught. And there, you need to do less shuffles because you shuffle like, you know, instead of shuffling each row, you shuffle like subsets of the rows. And this was the last uh, row in the table that I showed. So this is about Sudoku. The nice thing here is that it's basically like a mind game. So what do scientists do? They do, they play mind games, okay? Uh, and this is probably not useful for anything. But much of the research we now use in computer science, or definitely, I think, the research that was done with zero knowledge there, like early research in zero knowledge, uh, what the, you know, the pioneers did, they did mind games. They didn't think, I'm not sure if they thought about it, they thought that someone will actually implement this and use it for you know, large-scale applications. But basically, they were very curious. They wanted to see, OK, can I prove something you know, uh, uh, without, you know, Letting you any, telling you anything except for the fact that the proof is correct. In how many rounds can I do it? What type, what types of uh, privacy and zero knowledge can I do? So basically they were you know, kind of you know, playing mind games that in the end turned out to be very useful. Uh, so this is the essence of science and sometimes you do games for the you know, purpose of games uh, and sometimes you do it for uh, you know, something that turns out to be very useful. So I might say that you know, scientific freedom is very important because you know, no, I don't think that any manager should have, could have told you know, the pioneers of zero knowledge you know, 20 or 30 years ago, you should explore this because this is going to be useful. They were kind of you know, playing mental games and in the end came up with something very useful. 